Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of AWP, the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you once again for joining us on another quarantine edition. We are back here today. We do not have the entire crew, unfortunately, but we do have myself and the commish. Commish, how you doing? Yo, everything is... Well, as the world is going, you know, things are slowly getting back into place. I mean, we still have to be cautious. Everyone be careful out there. Um, so, quick shout-outs before we start the episode. Uh, first, we want to acknowledge, um, yes, it's just a one-on-one between the Shant and myself, the Kamish. Um, but please feel free to catch the BA Select Start show with the Shant and Dan the Man. As they bring you up to date current uh, episodes in regards to your favorite video games. Also, um, this is obviously not a WWE Network related episode that we're going to preview, guys. Yeah. But if you want to catch these topics we're going to talk about, um, again, check with your local cable provider or if you know how to access YouTube. You can literally Google it. Yeah. Google YouTube. Uh, what's our topic, Sean? Today we will be discussing um, not all because it'll be too much to cover. Uh, we are going to be covering some of the. Um, what's the name of the channel? Vice? Vice. Uh, their network. Uh, uh, did a few documentaries entitled it's it's a it's a series actually entitled Dark Side of the Ring, and basically what it encompasses is going through some very controversial things that happened either inside or outside of the ring, mainly kind of a behind the scenes BTS look, you know, during dark times. Um, I gotta warn everybody, I do recommend that you see these documentaries. However. Um, if you're trying to fall asleep or whatever, or you're thinking, let me watch something before I go to sleep, I would not recommend watching it at that time because coming from someone who did that on more than one occasion, I wasn't able to sleep afterwards just because, uh, it gets pretty dark depending on which one you watch. But, um, I think that it provides a, another layer behind some of these stories or some of these rumors that sort of have been circulating around the wrestling world, mainly WWE for years now. Um, some of the myths have been approved, some of them have been disapproved, um, but nonetheless we are here to cover the ones that we feel like stuck out to us the most or impacted us or made us feel something while we were watching and afterwards when we had a chance to sort of assess what we've just watched and sort of think about it. So, Kamish, I know you have a list that you've compiled, um, so why don't we go off of that? So, we're going to start with... This episode comes off their second season. It's the infamous Montreal Screwjob. Now, everyone has always made a a definitive choice of whose side they're on. And And amazingly, there's three sides. There's Shawn Michaels, there's Bret Hart, and Vince McMahon himself. Yeah. Now, I mean, everyone knows. Everyone knows the story. Everyone knows the the night, Survivor Series 97. Um, Controversial end to a championship match really unveiled. Uh, the invisible curtain, if you will, in regards to what is kayfabe, what is not kayfabe. What were your first thoughts when you saw like the full behind the scenes in regards to Jim Cornette and Jim Ross and how they felt, and everyone else involved, how they felt about this? Before I answer, let me just say that uh, we actually did cover the Montreal Screwjob uh, during season one. Um, I believe it was like episode 11 or 12 or somewhere around there. So feel free to check that out. But to answer your question, um, you know, I think at this point, the Montreal Screwjob, it's like beating a dead horse. We've heard it so many times. We've heard it from so many different perspectives. Someone says one thing. Another guy says another thing. Important part is that Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, for the most part, have patched things up and are able to coexist, you know, together. But watching this documentary, um, 
you know, one thing that stood out is that Bret Hart, I think he even says this, you know, in the beginning of the episode where he says, no matter whenever you ask me about the Montreal Screwjob, my story is never going to change because I'm, I'm telling you exactly what happened. One thing that stood out to me, here's the thing, and I think you and I, we, we talked about this uh, right after when we had both watched it. Bret Hart is a very nice guy. But he did something where I was like, okay, that's, that's like, that's being too much of a nice guy. I forget exactly how we said it, but, you know, he went up to Shawn Michaels, like, backstage. And Shawn Michaels, he's like, you know, Shawn was all, you know, cornered and, you know, he was sitting in a corner, not really saying anything with his head hung down low. And I went up to Shawn and I shook his hand and I said, thank you for the match. The funny thing, and I want to ask you this. As of recent, you know, Undertaker has kind of been doing his Last Ride um, series, uh, documentary series, and he's also been allowing for people to interview him. He also said something that in my mind was like, you know, maybe that could have fixed everything. Undertaker said, you know, I was amazed that Vince McMahon didn't just have it be Bret Hart versus Undertaker. Because I'm sure that Brett would have had no problem dropping the belt to me. And then if he wanted to take it off of me a week later or the next day, sure, whatever. But at least we wouldn't have gotten a Montreal screw job. What do you think? Do you think that would have been a good way to avoid things or fix things? Or do you think that would have maybe still, you know, uh, provided a, a lot more ruckus uh, around WWE? I personally think, because I saw that interview, was conducted, I think, through ESPN or something. Yeah. Um, I think having him pitch that idea maybe would have taken a lot of heat and cushioned the entire situation. Yeah. And it would have given Brett a clean way out. None of this would have maybe transpired, but I think in a way, like, that's Undertaker still trying to, like, be, like, the man. Like, yeah. the man in regards to he's the general behind the scenes, he's the leader of the locker room and right. he's trying to ease the tension in regards in, in, in regards to the situation. And it would have helped, I, although the, and during that time, the story may not have made sense to bring Undertaker into Brett's direction. Yeah. Because he was dealing with already losing to Sean via uh, Kane's introduction yeah. into the WWE at the time. Right. Although you could have worked something out. I think it, it could have happened because, again, Undertaker is your guy. He's the one who's always willing to play ball. Right. No problem. It could have changed some events as well in Undertaker's career. We, we probably would have never gotten that broken kayfabe Monday Night Raw infamous uh, promo of his yeah. where, he, where he did his shoot. Or maybe we would have still. We never know. Although, I do want to bring up something you brought up. Yeah. The whole thing about Brett shaking Sean's hand. Yeah. After the match. Now, everyone knows. I'm a Shawn Michaels fan. He's my guy. You know, he's top three in my list no matter what. Although, I do agree with you about Brett being too nice of a guy. I love Bret Hart. But come on, man. I would have punched Sean in the face. Yeah. Because you're really being too nice at this point to this guy who just played a part in like what is considered, of course, the biggest screw job of all. Yeah. Um, I think one other thing that was breathtaking was maybe for the first time ever, I might be mistaken, but for the first time ever, we also got Earl Hebner's perspective about the whole thing. Uh -huh. And... You know, I think that Earl is telling the truth how he's like, I didn't know anything about it up until I'm in Gorilla. And Vince or whoever goes, hey, when the sharpshooter is put on, you will ask for the bell. And Bret Hart, the funny thing is Bret Hart, he's like, I told Earl uh, like 24 hours or 48 hours before Survivor Series. I was like, you know, Earl, they're, they're going to have you screw me. You know that, right? And he's like, Earl was like, oh, I don't know, Brett. I, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure. They haven't told me anything. So 
So that like that's the one part where it's like you can only imagine you're a referee, you're not even a wrestler, you're just a referee, and you get these instructions seconds before you go out that hey, you're gonna ask for the bell when the sharpshooter is locked in. So I don't know, man. It's it's a very sticky situation. It's a very rough situation. And the funny thing is, uh Razor Ramon, Scott Hall. To this day, every single interview that he does about Montreal Screwjob, he says, I think the whole thing was a work. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think of that? I mean, when you have the constant interviews, the reminders of this historic, infamous event, you have all these people saying it could be a work or it could be this, it could be that. And sometimes you think about it like, well, someone brought up the whole situation of contract breach, that Brett could have sued Vince in regards to what he did to his character during the time. And Scott Hall, like, the guy lays it out. He never lies. He, he's direct about everything. Yeah. Whether he was drunk or sober. God bless his sobriety, by the way. Yeah. Commendable. Um. He's never lied. You can look him dead in the eyes and he says, I believe the Montreal screw job was a work. To this day, he he defends that. And he's never like, he like you know how people in interviews, like they raise their voice whenever they're agitated about a question yeah. or they're shook. Dead cold stare. Jake Roberts-esque. Yeah, he says it. It's a work. And maybe he's on to something. Maybe there's something we still don't even know. And maybe that's something, whether it's Sean, Brett, Vince, or whoever involved, you know, Pritchard, Cornette, Ross, maybe one of them is taking it deep to the grave. We don't know. Yeah. I, I would like to think maybe it is, but again, we'll never know. Well, I mean... If- in an ideal world, if it was a work, I would feel a little bit more better because you really consider Bret Hart has gone through so much. Um, everything from strokes to cancer to losing family members. Um, I mean, the surviving heart. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's tough. It's 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 tough stuff. Um, I feel like uh, Vince Russo and Jim Cornette you know, intertwining their interviews, uh, in the middle of that whole thing. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of resentment there towards the two. It's, uh, the, the funny thing is there's a part of me that's like, that wants to agree with Vince where it's like, okay, well, what did you want the guy to do? One of his, uh, employees was not willing to play ball. And we saw what happened with, uh, Alondra Blaze when she took the women's championship to Nitro and threw it in a trash can. So it was just kind of a way of like, hey, I don't want that happening again. So what do you do now? Do you screw the guy? No, that's I don't I don't think that's how you do it. But it seems like this Undertaker idea was somewhat teased. So I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but at this point, it is what it is. Like, we can only speculate for so long, so, and keep adding on to this. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, those are just my sentiments about the whole thing. Mine as well. Um, so we move on. You know, there's another episode. This was in the first season of theirs that they had. Uh, it's called The Match Made in Heaven. Yes. Um, which, which I would say this is, Mr. and Mrs. WWE. Interesting. No matter what. I, I, see, I say this because th- this is the star couple. This is the power couple everyone remembers. Yes. For, I don't care how old you are, how young you are. If you do your wrestling history or you learn it, you learn about these two. You learn about the original wrestler and his valet. Yeah. I'm talking about uh, the Macho Man, Randy Savage, and Miss Elizabeth, uh, the original heel and babyface like couple. And when you watch this episode, it seemed like wrestling and real life kind of blurred the lines a lot. Yeah. And my first. 
first reaction to this episode was like, wow, like, I can see why they're considered, like, you know, res- wrestling's, like, a couple, you know, why they were how they were, why they ended up, you know, they were married off screen, they were married on screen, they separated, you know, Elizabeth went down her path, you know, Randy went his. There was a lot in that episode that just opened my eyes to things. Yeah. Where I was just like, wow, like, I never knew. And it, it's crazy. Like, I, I don't know what your take was on this episode. Well, first of all, uh, God bless them both. Uh, both of them are no longer with us. Very, very sad. Really, very, very sad, especially when you hear how great of a person Miss Elizabeth was in real life. Not to say that Randy Savage was a horrible guy, because it, it doesn't sound that way. I just think that the guy was just paranoid about somebody else, you know, uh, laying eyes on, on his girl, essentially. That's one of those deals where it's like, you don't, you don't ever want something like that happening to someone like Miss Elizabeth and Macho Man. You don't want to hear people like that going down a road like that and having that be their fate. Um, I understand that it came to a point where Miss Elizabeth felt, you know, uh, very restricted and confined in the relationship that she was in, so she had to get out. I know that this is a little bit sensitive to a uh, subject for you, but then she goes on and real things start happening between her and Lex Luger. Um, Macho yeah. Man just kind of does his thing. Very, very sad. I, that, that's, that's really all I can say. Um, I won't lie when I say, I didn't, I obviously, I wasn't around during the 80s, you know, um, but yeah. every time when I see that clip um, after the Ultimate Warrior versus Randy Savage match, where Sensational Sherry is uh, beating up Macho Man, and Miss Elizabeth jumps the rail and throws her out of the ring, and there's this quick moment where they're sort of looking at each other, and the crowd, you know, is getting louder and louder, and finally they go in for that big hug, um, and Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan on commentary, I still get emotional when I see that, because as much as it is the F word, as much as it is scripted, there's a part of that where it's like, going back to your point, it bleeds into reality. It's not just seeing something... Like it's genuine. Exactly. It's really... Exactly. Like, they don't touch upon, like, the dark days that they encountered after their final separation, but they do encounter the regards of, like, what happened to each of them. And yeah. then you wonder what depth they could have gone, but I think that's obviously something that fans can explore themselves in regards to each of them as individuals. Yeah. I mean, it, it's tragic. It's something that really, like, makes makes my heart feel hurt in regards to Elizabeth, uh, for Randy, you know, that, that's the hard reality sometimes when you involve, like, your personal life into the business you work in. I don't want to talk much into this next episode because we ourselves have already done an episode in regards to this man. Uh, Stevie Richards. Yeah. A two-part episode in the beginning of their second season. Um, I don't know, quick thoughts, I don't, I don't know if you want to go deep into it. Um, I don't think it's necessary because we, again, we did like an hour long episode where we talked about the whole thing. I will just say this, very graphic episode, it's, it's a hard call, man. There are people who tell you Stevie Richards, um, the performer, should be in the Hall of Fame. And then there's people who tell you no because the person was just, he did what he did. That's not necessary. I just think one thing that's a very big shame is that WWE didn't extend that olive branch to help out the remaining members of the of the Richards family. Um, and you see Stevie Richards' child, or not his child, his, uh, his, his son, um, tell them how he doesn't want anything to do with WWE because when he needed them the most, they were nowhere to be found. But it, it, in, I think in the midst of recording, it shows you how um, Stevie Richards' its son and Nancy's sister actually sort of reunite because they also had a 
few years where they weren't speaking to each other. So, um, yeah, very gnarly situation, very graphic, yeah. very disturbing, but um, if we can pull out... If you, if, like, I'll say this, if you want to learn in regards to more about, you know, Stevie's family, and then also with, you know, people involved like Eddie Guerrero and his family, Vicky Guerrero, Chavo, and uh, even Chris Jericho. Yeah. Catch those two episodes. Um, but I want to move on because, again, we did an episode ourselves, I believe it was around through episode 40 through 50. and Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to move on. Uh, this episode particular scared the hell out of me because I've been a fan of this man and he kind of scared me when I realized who he really was off screen. And I'm talking about, as they entitled it, The Life and Crimes of New Jack. Yeah. Um, yes, he is the original gangster, the epitome of hardcore wrestling in CW's heyday. But when you watch this, be very precautious about it. Yeah. Uh, very disturbing episode. You know, they always say in wrestling, you always want to make it look like you're hurting the other person, but you're actually protecting them. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much all that I can really say about it. If you have the ability to really be strong about this, and you still love the aggressive, hardcore fashion that was of the early 2000s, late 90s, then this New Jack episode is for you, but... To the faint of heart, I'll advise you this. If you're going to be shocked to learn new things about New Jack, we warned you. Yeah. To be on the safe side. Yep. Because even me, as a, as a fan of his, I was shocked at the, the, the revelation and the things that I learned about his gruesome past. And honestly, it's, it's something not really settling to revisit. The next episode that they offered on the series, um, I think this this one hits like for all the uh, Attitude Era fans a lot because you learn a lot about your favorite wrestlers in that era and what they actually they dealt with a lot more than we even knew. Yeah. Uh, the brawl for all. Yeah. Sean, what what was your first reactions when you saw the episode? Like, I'm asking more questions, but what was your first reaction after you saw it? Well, um, considering the fact that this whole thing was orchestrated just so that someone can beat up Bradshaw, um, it's like, well, how the tables have turned, essentially. Um, I, it, it, it sucked, because when I think back to how um, Bart Gunn actually won the whole thing, and then... In spite of that, they bring Butterbean to just beat the holy hell out of them. Um, and Nine then, months later, by the way. I'm sorry? Nine months later. Nine months later at WrestleMania, and then this obviously led to Bart Gunn's eventual departure. Um, another case of basically you screwing somebody out of the company. Uh, I think that that's a horrible idea, you know, to put on a, a bunch of gloves on a bunch of wrestlers and go, hey, this is, a, this is everything is real. And Jim Cornette actually brought up a very good point where he said, the fact that we had to state that what you're about to see is real, you were basically insinuating that the rest of the show is, is the F word, which is something that you especially back then would never use. Um, like it's a gimmick all of a sudden. Exactly. So um, they had big plans for Dr. Death Steve Williams to eventually feud with Steve Austin. But then the whole thing just kind of fell flat. Very bad idea. You're putting people's health at risk. There's the whole conversation about concussions. I think it, all around it was just a very bad idea. Let, let's get the perspective going. Like what, it, was, it was based upon an idea of a guy having a grudge with a bully. And everyone knows Bradshaw's reputation Yeah. for years. But this is even before he grew that reputation of being the quote-unquote a-hole of the locker room. Like, I'm sure 
sure throughout his career, you know, he was punished for the things he did. You know, with the whole wrestler's core and then, you know, everything that, you know, the, the locker room mentality the boys had. And this was literally based on Vince Russo not liking Bradshaw. So he's like, okay, I'm going to pitch this idea that I'm going to pick, what was it, 16 wrestlers? I think so, yeah. I'm going to pick 16 guys, and I'm and I hate the way to say it like this, I'm going to throw a wrench into their careers. Yeah. Which is essentially what he did without realizing it. I mean, the bastard was just literally that. He was a bastard for this idea. And even Jim Cornette tried to tell him, this is not a good idea. But, of course, in typical Russo fashion, he pitched an idea. McMahon said it was it, it was great. Let's do it. And then this shortened, if not ended, a lot of careers. Yes, absolutely. And it sucks because it's like there were some of these guys in their prime that were, you know, at the height of what could have been an even better career. Yeah. But then we get all this crap because it's like, okay, concussions are real. The bruising in boxing is a lot worse than it is in wrestling. Yeah. And a guy died because of this. Yeah. Well, not exactly caused by this, but these injuries led to his death. Eventually, yeah. And it sucks because it's like, we're... Can you remember any of these matches, honestly? The only one, it sucks to say, but the only one that I somewhat, sort of, semi-remember is Bart Gunn and Butterbean at WrestleMania 15. Like you just see Butterbean, like, light him up. Like, nothing. I mean, I hate to say this, but if anything... I would have said, you know what, Bart? We didn't really plan for you to win this whole thing, but now that you have, this could be your one-way ticket to an opportunity. Maybe try putting the Intercontinental Championship on the guy. Um, You could have easily gone into a feud with Billy Gunn because they both used to be the Guns, you know, as tag team partners. Um, And just sort of see where things end up. Um, If it didn't work out... Hey, dude, sorry, we got nothing for you. We don't really know how you fit into, you know, this thing that we're now calling the Attitude Era. Um, We're going to have to let you go type of thing. That's just trying to get a positive out of a negative. But, yeah, if, if the whole... And that's why now I'm very happy to hear that the locker room is a lot more healthier and takes things like this a lot more seriously because... You know, you can only imagine back then people getting bullied and getting called names. Like, I hate to even bring this up, but you do remember Justin Roberts, right? The ring announcer? Yeah. So recently he was, uh, I think the guy just published a book, but apparently in in his book, if I remember correctly, and and I'm not paraphrasing out of context, he said how he probably would never return back to WWE just because of sometimes how hostile the backroom, like, how the locker room environment could be. And I think that even one time JBL looked at him in the face and said, why the hell are you even still alive? And we obviously uh, talked about Hana Kimura, I believe last episode, which you can catch that. It's on the, it's on the playlist on my channel. That whole thing about, Hey man, treating others with respect. You know, we even hear stints nowadays about Mauro Ranello, um, you know, uh, the guy go has bipolar disorder. Um, dude, treat everybody with respect. Like, if you got a problem with someone, like, let the boss know, try to sort it out, take action. But, you know, putting 16 guys in a real-life tournament and going, hey, in the midst of all this uh, quote-unquote fake wrestling, we're going to have a real boxing tournament. You know, and then the guy who who uh, who through blood, sweat, and tears, real ones, uh, conquers the whole thing. You screw him out of it. Um, again, it just seems like like obviously, I when when it comes to like screwing, Bret Hart immediately go, goes to the top of that list. 
But then you oh, have yeah. you have like all these honorable mentions. Like I know we're not gonna talk about it because uh, again, these are just episodes that that stick out to us in particular. But you know the fabulous Mula documentary. Wendy Richter apparently was screwed out. You know of the company, uh, Bart Gunn. Um, you know, just among others who were just either bullied or you know became a victim of circumstance, and the next thing you know, they're quitting the company. So, um, yeah, man, I'm gonna quickly just go back to this. Like, take care of each other, man. Like, I I get it. There are people who you're not gonna get along with, but. Don't go around saying, you know, uh, slurs like that or just, you know, find a rational way to deal with things. And, uh, you know, but obviously in, in the attitude that this was not, the, the world was not what it is now. So a very different yeah. time, but it is what it is. No, like, I, I want to add to that, too. Like, I, I know there there is ways you can literally tell someone, like, look, I don't like you, but I respect what you do. I have respect for you. Yeah. You don't have to like the whole world, but you should consider respecting someone for what they're trying to do. Like, honestly, all these individuals at the end of the day, they're, they're performers who are, are making a living. Yeah. They're, they're in this not only because it's their job and it's what they do to earn money, but it's their passion. It's their dream. And if you're going to be a self-centered, egotistical maniac going around like, making someone feel bad for doing something they love, then why are you doing it? Exactly, yeah. Like, why are you taking away from that person's dream? Like, that's not fair to them. And it's not fair to you to be that person to just shit all over it. Yeah. Like, everyone des- deserves a chance. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Especially... And it may not be in the WWE, you know, maybe it's at Impact, maybe it's at Ring of Honor, or... You know, in the indies or even with the competition of AEW right now. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention was I am very happy that people like uh, Sean Spears and Brody Lee and John Moxley and all these guys are honestly getting that opportunity because you don't know. Like my running joke, or it's not a joke, but like my running catchphrase is that I think that there is a CM Punk and a Becky Lynch out of most of those performers that you see. Most of these guys, much like Punk and much like Becky, uh, who didn't get the opportunity, who would get shunned down night after night. And they prove that, you know what, if you just give me the opportunity, I can make things happen. And here we are. So um, that's why I said, you know, Bart Gunn, he may look like just another generic wrestler, but you never know. You know, if you just worked on his gimmick and maybe gave him a title run, the guy could have, you know, been something. He could have, you know, made himself something. So, but at this point, it's uh, it's 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 ancient history, so to speak. Exactly. And then you know, I I hate the word the f word. Yeah. In in, in the sport of wrestling, because honestly. These individuals don't just show up to an arena, have muscles, and, and okay, I'm going to dress like this and act this way, and I'm either going to win the crowd over or I'm not. Yeah. They, they take this as serious as a football player takes his profession serious. They take this as serious as a baseball player does, or hockey, or basketball, whatever sport you want to mention to me, even with mixed martial artists, they take it just as serious as anyone else. I I don't care what spectrum you come from, but there is that the thing that I said, I hate the F word, especially when it comes into the sense of reality. Yeah. And what I mean by reality is the final episode that we're going to talk about. I think we're going to get into a little deeper of this because this one, this happened, well, I don't know when you witnessed it, but I actually witnessed it live. Like, they didn't show when it happened. Okay, so we're going to talk about Owen Hart. Yeah. In his final days. Um, so the night of the pay-per-view, they cut away. <laughs> immediately and me and my friends were sitting there like what the hell's going on why did they just suddenly like go into this weird pause you know 
Yeah. And then Jim Ross announced it. You know, there was a tragic accident. Something happened. You know, this is was not supposed to happen. It's not part of the show. And then he had to sit there and wait until they told him. And then they told him, oh, I, I don't want to be the one to have to do this, but I uh, just received the news that Owen Hart tragically passed away. Yeah. And the reason why I, I do not like when people say, you know, wrestling is fake, it's like, okay, you're going to tell me that this profession, this sport is fake, but yet there's these men and women who do this and have legitimate injuries, like career-ending injuries. How? They die because of it. Yeah. And you're still going to go around and tell me it's not real. I can't agree with you. I, I, I can't converse with you at that point. When this episode aired, I watched it late at night. So and did I. <laughs> it, it really hit me hard because it's like, you know, this is someone I grew up watching. When I was a kid, yeah, he was, a, he was you know, the blue blazer. He was a baby face kind of, kind of blurring the lines of, face heel, you know, you don't know whether to cheer him, boo him, you know, as an adult, it's like, you know, this guy had a family, he was probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. Yeah. This this one hurt. Like, it still hurts. Like, the guy died so young. Yeah. I, 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 do you remember when you first saw this? Um... Like, like when it happened, like the incident. I unfortunately was not watching at the time. I started watching a, a few years later. Um, however, thanks to you know just technology and video games and whatnot, I was able to get caught up. Um, honestly, before this documentary, that's I was literally just informed that Owen Hart, you know, while trying to um, from a harness go from one of the balconies of the arena to the ring that he fell. Um, and But it's like, much like everybody else, I never had any context as to why or what went wrong or, you know, what were the repercussions. Um, and for a long time, the, the, the question for me was, why isn't Owen Hart in the Hall of Fame? Um, and then watching this and getting the details and... And really is kind of soaking it all in and going, okay, I understand now. I get it. I just, I'm trying to come to grips with the fact of why they were so negligent when it came to um, harnessing Owen Hart. Uh, in the documentary, they stated that, oh, they were getting someone who was very professional and had done this, you know, a dozen times or whatever. And then his wife, who... God bless her, a very good investigation, has the actual harness that was on him right before he fell. And she says, look at this harness. This harness is not secure. It's not meant to hold a 200-pound wrestler who's going to glide from the balcony of an arena into the middle of the ring. I don't know. I don't know what went wrong. I don't know if, if they were just going to wing it and go, eh, everything will be okay, no problem. Um, but you don't do that. I know for a fact that, and again, we just talked about the locker room and the business being very different stuff like that nowadays is like, that's not going to fly. They would not risk even deliberately trying to do something like that. The one thing though, the one thing that just puzzled me the most, and I, I sort of had to pause for a second, dead middle of the documentary I don't know if it was, I, don't, I can't remember if it was Jim Ross or if it was D'Lo Brown or, or who it was that said it. They're like, you know, it was the Attitude Era and Owen Hart couldn't find a gimmick that was going to fit him in the midst of the Attitude Era. So therefore, that's why he went back to Blue Blazer. And immediately in my mind, I'm thinking, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't have a gimmick? The gimmick is right in front of you. We've talked about this to nausea, the black heart of wrestling, the heel, the, the, the game persona that they were going to try to slap on him. 
what do you mean you didn't have a gimmick? And that's where, to me, like, things didn't, didn't compute. I was like, really? You talk about Owen Hart being a good performer, a good guy in general. He's good on the mic. He could have a match with anybody. We've seen him have great programs with Bret Hart. What do you mean you didn't have a gimmick for him? The gimmick is right there. It's in front of you. The black heart of wrestling. And that was the moment that just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, it's, it was all right there. It was in front of you. I, like, did no one think of this? Like, hey, man, okay, we can kind of sort of semi continue the Bret Hart thing through Owen Hart. But he's no longer going to be the good guy, the, the, the savior, the hero. He's going to be the Black Heart, a heel that you essentially what Triple H was. And can Owen Hart do it? You bet he can. You bet he can. That guy, you know, I, I didn't watch him when he, was do, when he was wrestling. But from what I've seen, that guy could do anything. If he can have a program with his own brother and they can sell it. And to this day, people can tell you, WrestleMania 10, Owen Hart versus Bret Hart, one of the best matches in wrestling. There you go. Like that, that, that should tell you what kind of a performer these guys were. Their hearts, for Christ's sake. So... That's the part that just puzzled me. I was like, I don't get it. What do you mean? Like, I don't know. Like, did, did any of that go through your mind? Because I know we, we talked about this. The what if, if, if Brett, uh, or not Brett, if Owen Hart was the black heart of wrestling, where his career yeah. and everything could have gone. Did you think about that at all? Because I know you've talked about your disdain for the blue blazer gimmick. I, I personally, when I heard it, I had a moment. I paused it too. I'm like, are you like, are you? And I hate to, I apologize. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, you have nothing. You have everything. You have more than enough. All you gotta do is give the guy, give him an hour, and he, I bet you he'll come back to your office with an entire run through for the next couple of years of his own career. And it would it would have worked. I honestly believe he could have given you gold. And, and to hear that, oh, we didn't have anything for him. That's BS, man. I found that to be BS because I grew up watching Owen. And yeah, like the whole thing when you know he broke Austin's neck. Austin didn't want to work with him at one point because of it. You know, Owen, you you couldn't find a wrestler like Owen Hart. I, I will. I would ask anybody, anyone who is a fan of wrestling right now, to tell me who can take on Owen Hart and not give you a five star match. Like put Owen Hart like right like, at the time that he died, right? Yeah. You can't tell me he can't give you a five star match with the following wrestlers: Seth Rollins, Neil Bryan. Freaking, he can make uh, Roman Reigns give you a five-star match. Daniel Bryan. Yeah. Um, freaking, uh, who else? AJ, AJ Styles. Styles. Yep. I, I don't care. You can look at the current roster. Owen Hart would have given you a five-star match with any of them. Yeah. Bottom line. And you're telling me he didn't fit into the Attitude Era? Come on, man. Like, that that really upset me. And then, you know, the episode progressed. I started to understand more and more why he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. I respect uh, his wife's decision wholeheartedly. Like, the man deserves a lot more. And it's like... The, if you had never put that gimmick on him, swear Owen Hart would be in the Hall of Fame for a more decorated career. And I'm sure, I, uh, Sean, I am sure either it, he, even if he isn't in the WWE as a coach for NXT wrestlers, he could coach all, all those kids in AEW. Yeah. Bottom line. Like, you can't tell me, without mentioning the horrific death, a 
classic match he had. And I swear, the fact that you put him and Brett as the first match of WrestleMania 10, five star. One of the best matches of all time. Yeah. Like, he put on a program. And, and yes, like, as you watch that episode, you realize that was the launching point of the King of Hearts, you know. You can't tell me he didn't fit and that he wouldn't have transcended into the Attitude Era, no problem. Like, that that pisses me off really bad. You know, I, 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 I hate to go in this direction, but considering everything that happened with Bret Hart, I don't know if this was maybe trying to hold back the hearts in a sense where it's like, well, we got rid of Brett. We still got to deal with Owen. What if we just, just don't push him. Just leave him in the corner. Let him do that blue blazer gimmick. Ah. Um, well, I, I don't know if you remember, but I think they had said, like, they gave him a contract extension. Yeah. They threw more money at him. It, that was their way of kind of like, okay, we, we don't want to deal with you, but you're still something to us. Not everything, but something. Yeah. But how do we keep you happy? Oh, here's some money. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah, it's, and and this is where it goes back to, like, Attitude Era was no saint, you know, everybody wants to talk about the PG Era and the Reality Era and how these eras have their flaws, well, guess what, so did the Attitude Era, so did the Hulkamania Era and the New Generation and the Ruthless Aggression Era, no matter what, and, and again, there's a reason why they're calling it Dark Side of the Ring, this is like all the behind the scenes of what nobody has ever known, um... It's not pretty. Yeah, it's not. And especially when you hear his kids talk about what a great father he was, um, you know, because of wrestling, Owen Hart is not with us. And, and not even to the point where it's like, oh, he got injured in a match. Just because of negligence, Owen Hart is no longer with us. Um, and not even his own negligence. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, again, like... Stuff like that nowadays, I'm sure that they go through numerous rehearsals and they have an entire squad that's overseeing the whole thing to make sure nothing goes wrong. But, um, very tragic, like, man. Very tragic. Like, it's tragic. And imagine, like, it's one thing that Owen was doing this for a while, coming down from the rafters. How many times did we see Sting do it? Yeah. Throughout his career, even he had said it in, like, interviews outside of wrestling. He said, I was terrified to do this. I, there wasn't a night where I didn't complain. Like, at one point, I didn't want to do that anymore. But he still did it. And, you know, God forbid something horrible had happened to Sting. Yeah. Uh, it's just... Everything has a flaw. Like yeah. this, this episode we recorded, we we weren't we're not trying to like highlight just the neg the positives of everything in wrestling. There is negatives that happen in wrestling as well, and we're we're coming off as unbiased about things, but particular things like this, yes, we show a biases in regards to what could have been or what should have been in regards not just to the person as a wrestler, but also to their life. Yeah. Like, it, it's tragic to hear his daughter saying, I didn't get the chance to really have my father there. Like, that hurt. Yeah. And then he, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, and then his son saying, like, yeah, I got a few years to be with dad, but then not anymore. Like, that was heartbreaking to me. And even then, there was something I remember, like, the night of the incident, uh, they interviewed uh, Jimmy Corderas, former WWE referee. Yes. And he said, like, you know, Owen, even to the final seconds, he told me to move out the way. Watch out. Yeah. And that, and to him, he said, like, you know, that showed me, even at the very end, like, how big his heart was. You know, because something could have happened to me. I could have been seriously injured or 
you know, you never know. Yeah. And to me, that's like, this man literally gave his life to the thing he loved. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's so tragic. Dark side of the ring is just that. It's the dark side of every situation that you can think of. I do recommend it, but if you're at a point where you're kind of low and uh, you need to be uplifted, do not watch it. Hang off and watch it some other time. But in regards to knowledge and just insight, I do recommend it. Because especially if an Owen Hart is your favorite wrestler, if a Bret Hart is your favorite wrestler, if a Macho Man is your favorite wrestler, um, you need to have that insight of what did and did not happen. So... With all that said, guys, once again, on behalf of the commission, myself and AWP, we would like to thank everybody who tuned into the episode. Um, once again, you can catch the dark side of the ring just by YouTubing it or Googling it, or uh, you can get in touch with your uh, local um, uh, cable provider or whoever is supplying you with content. Um, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, we, we do indeed recommend it. And um, with all that said, uh, we have concluded another episode of AWP Anything Wrestling Podcast. Once again, in these times, we encourage everybody to stay home and stay safe and stay well in the midst of everything that's happening. And we will catch you all next time.